Hello and welcome to the Clinical Update podcast from MIMS Learning. I'm Pat Anderson, editor of MIMS Learning. MIMS Learning aims to educate and inform healthcare professionals through learning modules, webinars and live events featuring doctors and other clinicians who are passionate about their field of expertise. I'm here with Sangeeta Krishnan, a medical editor who's responsible for our dermatology specialty, among others. Welcome, Sangeeta. Hi, Pat. Thanks for having me. So this podcast is aimed at healthcare professionals and as medical editors, we're not clinicians ourselves. We're just passing on key messages from the CPD that we have. And this is intended to inform your clinical judgment. Later, we'll be featuring an interview by our fellow editor, Dawn Powell, with diabetes clinical advisor, Dr. Tom Crabtree about diabetes technology. And wrapping up, we'll feature a learning nugget about a condition that affects many healthcare professionals as well as patients. You can probably guess what this is. But for now, Sangeet is going to talk to us about the hot topic of monkeypox. Thanks, Pat. So before I begin, the name has changed. It's Mpox now. Ah, OK. Uh, can you explain why, why there's been that change? So the WHO has some expert consultations with the International Classification of Diseases, after which they recommended calling it Mpox. The name was changed just last November from monkeypox for a range of reasons such as scientific appropriateness and the absence of geographical or zoological references. I think that the aim was to avoid causing offence to any cultural or ethnic groups. But for the moment, it's still acceptable to use monkeypox, but they plan to phase this out by the end of the year. Thanks. Uh, I'll try and use mpox from now on. While we get used to the sound of that, let me talk about our dermatology module on monkeypox. It's still called monkeypox, so as you can tell, it was written before the name change. It's been written by Dr. Sunita Kochar for dermatologists, GPs, and other healthcare professionals. Dr. Kochar is a GP with an extended role in dermatology. In the module, Dr. Kochar describes the transmission, symptoms, various approaches for testing and tracing, and symptom management, and there's loads of practical information about it. It's been very well received by our audience, which is why I wanted to discuss this, because we've had feedback from hundreds of learners on how useful it is. A quick definition first, Mpox is a viral zoonotic disease that presents with symptoms similar to, but less severe than those seen in smallpox patients. It belongs to the same genus as smallpox, that's orthopox virus. And we all know about the outbreak that started last year in May in countries where this virus is not endemic, including the UK. It is a self-limiting disease and the symptoms last up to four weeks. But you do see more severe presentations in some cases, like in immunocompromised individuals or in children. There is a maculopapular rash, which progresses to vesicles and pustules, which ultimately crossed over. If you'd like to know more about the symptoms, there's a handy printable infographic available in the module. It's important to identify Mpox to help contain a possible outbreak because contacts uh, of the person who's infected may be at risk as well. So contact tracing is needed. If a patient is thought to be a close contact of someone who's been diagnosed with Mpox, It is advised to contact the local health protection team for further guidance. It is likely that a travel history will be relevant. So what kind of symptoms should clinicians be looking out for? So some of the major symptoms that Mpox initially presents with include fever, headaches, myalgia and lymphadenopathy. There is a rash on the face and limbs after the first couple of days. And like I said, there is a printable infographic in the module, which will be linked below. And it's a really handy guide. I think every clinician should have. So I highly recommend that you go into the module and download it for yourself. So my perception is that some people might be more vulnerable than others to Mpox. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Anyone can get Mpox, but some groups are more vulnerable. There are increased rates of transmission that are seen in men who have sex with men, gay and bisexual people in the UK. 
The gov.uk website mentions that the infection was passed on mainly through close contact in interconnected sexual networks. There are other modes of transmission and like I said before, it's a zoonotic disease which means it spreads through animals, it spreads through direct contact with lesions in those that are infected or through contact with in infected body fluids and blood and in humans it is the same close contact spread is following exposure to infectious res respiratory droplets or in con from contact with contaminated clothing or bed linen. So if I suspect a case of MPOX, what other differentials should I consider? There are several differentials to consider. There's chickenpox, um, syphilis, bacterial skin infections and a rash that may be associated with HIV seroconversion. And it can be differentiated from chickenpox by the lymphadenopathy because that is more significant in mpox. And how serious is it? Mpox is mild for many. It is self-limiting and it lasts for up to four weeks, but it may have more serious sequelae in risk groups like the immunocompromised people and children. Then secondary infection may lead to sepsis and corneal infections, which may lead to loss of vision uh, and the mortality rate is up to 6%. And is this still an outbreak? So in the last update of MPOX on 19th December 2022 on the gov.uk website, they did mention that there were no new cases reported in the week prior. So I think we can safely assume that we're past this particular virus for now. OK, well, that's good news. So no current MPOX virus outbreak, although, of course, recently in early 2023, late 2022, we had flu, we had lots of scarlet fever and lots of other bugs. Next, Dawn Powell is interviewing Dr. Tom Crabtree, who's an ABCD Clinical Research Fellow and is the Young Diabetologist and Endocrinologist Forum Chair 2022-23. He's going to talk about the growing field of technologies for diabetes self-management. Thanks for the introduction, Pat. As well as being an ABCD Clinical Research Fellow, Tom is our Diabetes Clinical Advisor. For our monthly diabetes research briefing, he provides expert commentary on the latest data. A particular interest of his is diabetes technology, so I'm going to be picking his brains about all things diabetes tech and how they might improve things for patients. So Tom, welcome to the podcast. Thanks again for the uh, introduction Dawn and thank you for having me. So there's been a lot of discussion about continuous glucose monitoring or CGM. What is it and how does it work? Continuous glucose monitoring is a glucose sensing technology that is usually inserted into the arm or onto the abdomen. This device is usually applied using an insertion tool and that with a small needle leaves a cannula under the skin and this cannula will then sense the glucose levels in the interstitial fluid giving a continuous reading of glucose levels for the person with diabetes to measure their glucose levels. Okay, thank you. So when you're talking about insertion, I'm and I presume that this is not an operation. This is just a very simple procedure. It's it's like something that could be done in a GP practice type thing. Most people with diabetes actually insert them themselves. Um, the devices all look a little bit like a stamp almost. You know, something. You know, like if, when you used to go to the library and they used to stamp your library books. I always think they look a little bit like like that will work in a very similar way to that. So it's something people can do at home and do themselves with a little bit of education. Okay. So it's not, it, yes, yeah, it's, it's a very, very minimally invasive procedure. It's something, and I suppose a patient as well, they're used to injecting themselves and doing finger prick testing. So they, it, they kind of would be used to doing this type of thing anyway. Exactly. Okay. I know like in, in your research briefings, you refer to something called flash monitoring. Is this the same thing as CGM? The terminology we use is starting to change a little bit. So um, flash glucose technology, um, such as Freestyle Libre, works in a very slightly different way. We've now called this intermittently scanned glucose monitoring. So the main differentiating feature between Freestyle Libre and real-time continuous glucose monitoring, which is the other type of, of CGM, uh, is that you have to scan it to get the results. So you don't get an automatic 
feed of data into your phone or device that you're using, you have to take your phone and you have to scan the sensor to see the readings. With a real-time continuous glucose monitor, this data is fed continuously into the device. There's no need to scan, so it removes that step. What are the advantages over intermittently scanned glucose monitoring over real-time and vice versa? So, as a general rule, intermittently scanned glucose monitors are at a lower price point, so they're a little bit more readily accessible and we have more access to them uh, on the NHS than we do real-time continuous glucose monitors. Now, real-time continuous glucose monitoring has advantages over intermittently scanned because it has more robust integrated alarm systems and the ability to predict when someone might be going low. So, for instance, it could give you a warning that it thinks you're going to have a hypo within the next 15 minutes and allow you to take action before that happens rather than with the flash glucose monitoring or intermittently scanned glucose monitor such as Freestyle Libre where you will get an alarm with the newer versions of it but it's only once you've crossed that threshold. Okay thank you and just to clarify when you said um, hypo you mean hypoglycemia? Hypoglycemia sorry. Okay and um, so you're talking about the advantages there of one type of CGM over the other the benefits of intermittently scanned CGM is that it's probably more cost effective or cheaper and the benefits of real time for the patient is they're not having to scan to get the results or get the results straight away or automatically. Okay, but what about the benefits of CGM over traditional finger print? testing? So there's, there's many advantages. So I mean, I think the first thing and the most important thing is the improvements in quality of life. Um, often this technology is life changing. People don't have to prick their fingers eight times a day to get glucose readings. And that's an advantage that really can't be understated. There's other advantages that apply to the, both the people with diabetes, but also to us with healthcare professionals. And that's in terms of the, the amount of data we get. And when we went through the COVID pandemic and we sort of started moving to virtual consultations, having this data in the cloud really gave us the ability to have data-driven consultations um, remotely without having to see people face-to-face -face with glucose diaries. And that was a, a, a massive change for us. It has also been a steep learning curve and that's taken a little bit of getting used to, but actually I think most of the data people get and most of the useful insights people get from using this technology when it comes to monitoring their own glucose levels are fairly intuitive. So a really good example of this, for instance, is around insulin timing. So when people were doing four, maybe four glucose measurements a day, you know, before eating, they would see what their glucose levels before they ate, but they wouldn't understand perhaps how their glucose levels would go up and then come back down um, after eating if they took their insulin a little bit later than they should have done and actually um, Freestyle Libre and CGM have allowed uh, people with diabetes to recognise that as a problem, for that to be identified and for that to be acted upon. So that's a really good example of one of the intuitive things that people have learned from using this technology. All right, thank you. And just to, for disclaimer purposes, Freestyle Libre is a type of CGM and I think it's probably the most well known and the one most commonly available on the NHS, but other brands are available, as the BBC would say. But just, it's interesting because you did sort of talk about um, flash monitoring or intermittently scanned CGM being available on the NHS. And I think that relates to the fact that NICE updated their guidelines on diabetes last year. And that, that was like a big thing at the time because it really expanded who could access CGM. So now on the NHS, who can get CGM? So the NICE guidelines have very recently changed. So all people with type one diabetes now should have access to intermittently scanned or flash glucose monitoring. The new type one NICE diabetes guidelines have uh, broadened access to real-time CGM, although lots of areas have yet to ratify this because they're relatively new guidelines in most places in the country. This is going through business cases, discussions, and will hopefully get approved. Um, for people with type 1 diabetes, they should now be offered the choice between intermittently scanned and real-time continuous glucose monitoring. The other thing that we've seen within the guidelines is actually an expansion of access to intermittently scanned uh, glucose monitoring for people with type 2 diabetes and other types of diabetes in specific situations. So anyone who's using insulin on dialysis, for instance, or people who are using a multiple daily injection regime, so taking more than two insulin injections a day with other types of diabetes, should now be able to access uh, intermittently scanned glucose monitoring in the same way as someone living with type 1 diabetes.
Okay, well, thank you for that. And I just, I think just a quick point to clarify as well, when you're saying access to CGM is slightly different for children, do they get access to real time, is that, or? Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit less familiar with the paediatric guidelines, but I understand that they've got much broader access to the uh, real time CGM than we do in adults. We are also now hearing a lot about hybrid closed loop systems. What are they? So hybrid closed loop systems combine the sensing technology that we've already been talking about with insulin pump therapy. The sensor and the pump will communicate to each other. The glucose data from the sensors are fed into an algorithm, which will then make decisions on whether to increase, decrease or maintain insulin delivery to maintain people at a pre-specified glucose target. Now, this will manage people's glucose levels quite well outside of meal times, but they do still have to remember to uh, bolus insulin for their meals and for the carbohydrate into that they may take. Um, so it's really useful. It is very life changing technology. But the reason we call it hybrid is because it's not a fully closed loop system. So they do still have to engage with it around meal times and uh, bonuses for meals. I didn't know why that was why it was called hybrid. So that's really useful information. What evidence is there that hybrid closed loop systems could benefit patients? There's lots of evidence out there. There's been randomized control trials of the various different systems out there, all of which have demonstrated uh, decreases in HbA1c and improvements in, in time and glucose range, which is really good to see. We've got lots of evidence as well that it improves quality of life. Um, you'll probably be aware, and listeners may be aware as well, of the NHS England pilot of hybrid closed loop technology, which launched in 2021, which feels like it was only yesterday because I've been quite so heavily involved with it. But yeah, it's 2021 it started and we've been collecting real world data from users who've been granted access to this. And that has demonstrated again reductions in HbA1c and that's fed into the NICE TA, which will hopefully be finally approved at some point during 2023. Okay, so you mentioned the TA day, so that stands for Technology Appraisal. What does that actually say about what it's planning to do in giving access to hybrid closed loop systems? So I think the first thing to highlight is, is a technology appraisal slightly different from NICE guidelines. So a, a guideline does not have to be adopted by a region. NICE have done all the work, but actually if a region considers from their own financial perspective or for whatever reason that they can't or aren't willing to deliver on the NICE guidelines, then they don't have to. A technology appraisal, however, is a legal mandate for anyone who uh, meets the criteria to require that to be provided uh, on the NHS. So it's a much stronger you know, recommendation for the technology that has to be implemented. The technology appraisal, which came out in draft form, I think it was at the end of January off the top of my head, recommended that hybrid closed loop technology should be used for people with type 1 diabetes. Uh, this is for adults, I should say. Uh, if the HbA1c is above 64 millimoles per mole, and that's something that we're going to have to deliver on, but that should give quite broad access to this technology. Some people have argued it's not gone far enough. Certainly, it's in the feedback phases. I hope that there'll be more recognition for its role in hypoglycemia at the moment. I think that that's missing from it because although most people who have severe hypoglycemia and impaired awareness do access this technology, if it's not in the technology appraisal for the reasons we've already discussed it may be a, cause a bit of regional variation, which we wouldn't want to do. And then also people with diabetes have highlighted that it's sort of underestimated the impacts that this technology has on quality of life. Personally, I view it as a very positive first step towards access to, to closed loop technology, and I'm fairly happy with, with it in its current format. I think down the line, we have to look at trying to give access to this technology to all people with type 1 diabetes. But as a first initial step, I think it's a positive thing. Okay, well, thank you for that. In your research briefings, you've referred to something called DIY systems. Can you just explain what they are? Because they are like hybrid closed loop systems, but I imagine it's more something the patient does. Yeah, so the community online of people with diabetes are always pushing the boundaries. And this is a fantastic example of people taking their medical conditions into their own hands and moving forward with developments and outpacing, you know, commercial companies. Um, the DIY movement started in around 2015 and a group of people with diabetes, primarily some of you may have heard of Dana Lewis in the States, but they developed their own system using the glucose sensing technology that was available at the time and the existing insulin pumps, developed an algorithm and some people with diabetes adopted these systems because access to the commercial systems 
commercially available systems was very limited or actually there wasn't really anything on the market that did what they wanted it to do. There's still plenty of people using these systems in clinic. They're not licensed uh, and they're not approved. Well, I say that uh, one of them has recently been approved in the States. So will be becoming available commercially shortly. But we've got lots of evidence now to suggest that these are safe and that they are effective at improving people's glucose levels. And all of the position statements and consensus statements that have been produced around this say that we should continue to support users by providing them with NHS funded equipment if they opt to go down this route. Whether or not we suggest it as an option in clinic is a slightly different debate. I think with the availability of commercial systems, we would probably not recommend DIY ourselves as an option for people. But if people are using these systems or find out about them, then we're happy to support their use in uh, whatever way we can. Okay, well, thank you for that. That's really interesting and helpful. You do talk a, a lot about diabetes tech, uh, not just hybrid closed root systems or CGM in your research briefings. What other things or diabetes tech are you seeing come out onto the horizon? So um, there's lots of, of other technology out there. I think there's going to be an increasing role for smart pens, for instance, for connected pens. They're quite a useful bridge between injection therapy and pumps. Fill that sort of gap for people who can't access pumps or don't wish to, to allow them to record their insulin data. Certainly there'll be more work around the apps that go with that to maybe integrate bolus calculators and glucose data hopefully at some point giving a degree of closed loop in injection form so that'll be interesting to see where that goes obviously glucose sensing technology is moving forward all the time and it'll be interesting as well to see where where this goes as well what we really want to see is continuous glucose monitors that are reliable as many of them are already but that are perhaps at a lower price point and the more options we can give our our people with diabetes and clinic you know of where to wear them how to wear them how to use them how invasive they are it's, it's going to be an important factor moving forwards i think thank you for that it's really interesting to hear about the developments in diabetes tech and where it might go. People with diabetes have to self-manage a lot and the more physicians and nurses can do to support them with tech seems to be the better, really. Yeah, I think my strong belief is that there are few, if any, other medical conditions that divide so much cognitive energy from the people living with it as does type 1 diabetes and anything that we can do to make that easier we should so if we can take you know having to write people's insulin doses down people having to do finger pricks and write their glucose doses down anything we can do to improve quality of life and allow people to free up some headspace for things outside of managing their type 1 diabetes we should do okay thank you for that and so now just finally talking about improving quality of life what technology do you wish existed or wish you had that would make your life easier it's a very good question. I had some time to think about it, and I don't really know. I think AI is going to be interesting moving forward. What I really want is some sort of artificial intelligence to manage my diary, research, and work commitments without me having to think about it. But I have tried a few options and haven't quite landed on it on a, an answer to that. So if anyone has any answers, please let me know. <laughs> and I'm getting on a plane today to go to conference. I don't really like flying, so if anyone could think of a more efficient way of transportation, like a teleporter, then that would also be really appreciated. <laughs> I, I think I have to agree with you there. Beam me up Scotty Star Trek thing. They need to invent that at some point. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, thank you so much for the interview, and you've been a really interesting interview and really great information on diabetes tech. Thank you very much. No worries. Thank you again for having me. I'm back with Dawn and Sangeeta to discuss a learning nugget that Dawn has unearthed in one of her research briefings. What's the topic here? The topic is long COVID, which was the subject of a study featured in the January 2023 respiratory research briefing by Dr. Swapna Mandel. In this study by Hansen et al, it showed that the mean duration of long COVID symptoms was nine months for people who had been hospitalised and was four months for people who had not been hospitalised. The common long COVID symptoms included persistent fatigue with bodily pain or mood swings, ongoing respiratory problems and cognitive problems. Dr Swapna Mandel in the briefing observes that this study shows that the ongoing effects of COVID continue to be very real. She has that going forward the key steps are to understand more about the symptoms of long COVID. For example, 
why these symptoms occur and who they affect. Such information, she adds, could help healthcare professionals provide the right services and treatments for people with long COVID. As might be expected, research on COVID is frequently covered in the respiratory research briefings. If it's not every month, it's every other month. However, I am wondering if we will start to see focus shift towards long COVID or the long-term effects of a severe COVID infection. Sangeeta, I think that gastroenterology research briefings frequently has content on both COVID and long COVID. Yes, Dawn, you're right. The virus may trigger autoimmune conditions like celiac and IBD in conjunction with other environmental factors in people who already have a genetic predisposition. And as more research is ongoing, I'm sure we'll see a lot more of this in the future. And we already have a study that was published in our research briefing last year in April, in which the composition of the gut microbiome was found to be altered in long COVID. And we all know that an altered gut microbiome is closely related to so many other conditions. Yeah, I'm seeing research about this in the primary care specialty as well. I actually looked up and according to the office For national statistics, 2 million people in the UK self-reported long COVID in February 2023. It didn't say how many of these were healthcare workers, but inevitably, I'm sure many thousands will be. And one doctor recently called for more compassion and understanding for clinicians with long COVID. The good news is, as Dawn's pointed out, that the majority of symptoms resolve within a year. Dr Ravi Ramanathan's primary care research briefing highlights some research about this. And Ravi says that with limited access to long COVID clinics... This is reassuring news for patients. I guess it's not so reassuring for doctors who can't refer patients to the long COVID clinics. One thing we do have on the site among many pieces of CPD around COVID is a recorded webinar with Dr Harsha Master, who's a GP and was a pioneer of setting up a long COVID clinic herself. Dr Master provides a lot of practical tips and it's well worth a listen because there may be things that as a clinician you could do for your patients while they're waiting for that appointment at the long COVID clinic clinic to come up. I think this has been a really interesting discussion and I'm sure more information and data for long COVID will emerge in the future. However, and this is just a casual observation as a non-medical person, I'm wondering whether other post-viral conditions can provide any information about long COVID. For example, both ME and postural tachycardia syndrome or POTS can develop after an illness such as glandular fever. And they do share some of the same characteristics as long COVID. For example, fatigue is a major one with all three of them. Therefore, perhaps what is already known about these conditions can provide an insight into long COVID. Or similarly, perhaps research into long COVID can expand the knowledge of other post-viral conditions. Thanks, Dawn. Thanks very much for listening to this podcast. We'll be back in a fortnight's time. You'll find links to the learning materials we've talked about in the podcast description. Thank you.